Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Briggs, the Head of Engagement at the EMA, and I'm lucky enough to be joined today by Paul Jarvie, who's the Manager Employment Relations and Safety at the EMA. And um, Paul, you're also the recent recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Safeguard New Zealand um, Health and Safety Awards. So you might start hmm. by telling us a bit about that and then and then a bit about what you do here. Yes, look, I started off life as a physiotherapist many, many years ago and um, uh, worked in a place called Mount Isa, a um, uh, very large mine, 5,500 staff, about 3,500 underground and 2,000 on top. And I guess from a physio perspective, you started seeing a lot of people coming up with injuries. Um, over a f- several years, you see the same people coming up with the same injuries going, this, if this is the medical model, we're not actually fixing things. So being the in- inquisitive person that I am, I went and started going underground and started looking at trying to fix problems at the, at the, um, at the source rather than just fixing the person. Um, so ever since then, I came back to New Zealand and been involved in, in kind of the health and safety side, not so much the treating side. Yeah. So um, I guess that recognition is uh, in part the, the work that I've done in that space. Brilliant. So that explains also why you have a good Australian accent. Uh, yes, time a kangaroo down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, look, t- today we're here to talk about something, and I could not find a lot of information uh, about this out on the internet mm-hmm. or um, speaking to people. We're talking about duty of care for employers mm-hmm. around remote working. Yep. And you're involved in a project with ACC, WorkSafe, and some other partners mm-hmm. on looking into this. Can you yep. tell us what, what motivated you guys to get together and look at this? Yeah, well, we just started sitting around, really, and just chatting about it. And and what we found was individual companies had their own policies and procedures uh, as to how they were handling it um, and what they were doing in terms of providing staff with resources. Um, Some were going very large, some were going quite small. Um, And then that kind of morphed into, well, what would WorkSafe deem it to be a practicable thing to do? Um, and then when we, when we looked into that, well, it's pretty kind of grey. Um, and this, so then we did some research and looked at, at the ACC legislation because the ACC legislation and WorkSafe legislation, uh, while they talk about workplaces, they have different views of what a workplace is. So that just poses a whole lot of questions. So I guess that was one of the starters. But, but equally, what we've seen in the last couple of years is probably three main drivers as to what would instigate a person working from home. Mm. So what's been the norm uh, from employment law is an employee can ask to work from home, and that's called um, flexible working. And generally that's of a short-term nature. Mum's sick, dad's sick, the kids are sick, I'm sick. Um, So they do it from home to meet a a requirement that's here and now. Um, It's short-term, the employer says, yes, that's fine knowing full well that there's an end point and the person's going to come back to work. So that's always been kind of happening and we'd kind of call that rehab, I guess, in a a sense. Then a couple of years ago, we had COVID. And literally overnight, the whole world turned upside down and employers had to keep their businesses going, but people couldn't come to work. So that was the the second driver was where employers pivoted, I love that word, (laughs) um, uh, and made it very, or enabled staff to work from home, uh, providing software programs and all the tools and bits and pieces, and that really ran for two, two and a half years. Following on the back end of that, from some of the success stories of the COVID experience, now we're seeing that company decided, well, people can work from home. Mm. Um, We can trust them. They're not going to be sitting outside in the sun all day or taking the dog for a walk or whatever else. Um, So there's a bit of a move to the third way of of people working from home, and that's really from a company strategy, a company perspective. We want you to work from home. Um, So the three main drivers, one is a rehab, one is uh, if there's a pandemic type of thing, uh, and the third by company strategy, I guess. Okay. the company strategy one tends to be a lot longer, um, and there are variations inside that. Some it's five days a week. It could be three and two, th- three, three at home, two at work, a whole lot of variations. So that's how it happens, but, mm. but what we still don't know are the legal 
boundaries of, of all that. Okay, so what we've got is a situation where people are already doing it mm. and the law is playing catch-up um, mm. because you, you've mentioned um, prior, to, prior to the podcast, mm. you've looked at some case law overseas. Yeah, so um, when we look at overseas stuff, and obviously there are different jurisdictions, but it's a little bit scary. Um, one particular case was in Australia where a couple were working from home. They were partners. Um, they ha- I think they had a child together. Um, the husband had mental health issues, uh, thought that his partner was undermining his practice, and he killed her. Oh, my God. Um, and the insurers over there said, well, your home is not at work. Went to the, went to the high court. Mm. The high court said, it's a workplace. Right. Even though it happened early in the morning, the judges were basically saying, well, the person was able to work and therefore was a workplace. Wow. Um, we've had other cases uh, in Canada uh, where um, the whole house has been to be deemed to be a workplace. So someone falls in a kitchen getting a cup of coffee, that's a workplace. Okay. And so we don't quite know where those boundaries are. We've been... Um, advising our members to have policies that kind of ring fence. So the office, the lounge, the kitchen, the bathroom, for our purposes, are the workplace. If you go outside that, maybe not a workplace. Okay. But the courts are saying, well, we're taking a wider view. So what we're trying to do is to is to come up with where we think the courts might go. Okay. Um, because this has got real connotations for ACC. If the if the courts are saying your whole house is a workplace, then a stumble over the cat in the hallway is a workplace accident. I got you. So therefore compensatable by the employer and by ACC. Wow. So, I mean, I guess that's what it comes down to is we're talking about duty of care and uh, the case in Australia, um, that's a horrible, horrible story, but the the workplace is liable somehow for, for what actually occurred. Yeah, well, interesting. the courts said there, it wasn't so much the workplace, but the person was at the place of work, e.g. Okay. the home, yep. and therefore she was able to work when a call comes through. Okay. Because they basically were giving financial advice over the phone. Um, so when the phone rang, they're at work. Right, yeah. So the fact of being in the house was being at work. Um, Correct. But equally, from a health and safety perspective, and from an HR perspective, I guess, the question really becomes, well, what does an employer do and how far do you need to go to satisfy your requirement to provide a safe workplace? It's a, it's a good point. We're managing risk here, aren't we? Well, we are, because does that really mean then that you need to do some form of psychological testing of your staff in terms of what's their risk factor at home in terms of psychological risk or people knocking on the door? How, where do you go? I mean, we just don't yeah. know those answers. You're right. It's, it's a piece of string. And, and um, even if we take it back to a, to a lower level, like just ergonomics, so mm. which is something you, you've mm. you know, had a lot of involvement in, if my, if my office chair is set up for me ergonomically and then my daughter comes and sits in that chair and changes the height and mm. you know, getting it back to an ergonomic um, mm. perspective is something I probably don't know how to do. Yep. And yet if I have a repetitive strain injury, yep. um, you know, that could lead to some legal trouble. What it could do, and, and again, it really poses the question, how far do you go? And, and do you supply your whole, a whole setup as you would in your own workplace, say um, your, your primary workplace, right, rather than being at home, which is a huge cost on employers. Um, yeah. We found during COVID that especially students were working from their, their rooms sitting on their beds yeah. uh, because the lounge was a common space. So... Uh, so how far do you go and what's reasonable and and so what reasonable means for a small employer is quite different from a large employer yep so we're just trying to draw up some form of um, I guess not so much priorities but what might be seen as being reasonable I know some employers say well if if you can't set up your own workplace like this you can always come back to the office okay yeah yeah, and I guess that's what we're talking about really is that it's a choice at this stage, um, although I guess more and more so it's less of a choice because people are looking for hybrid working yeah. and remote working and yeah. they wouldn't look at a job that was um, yeah. back yeah. into the office. But, yeah. ha- you know, the, talking about the risk and how far it could extend, PJ, you've, you've mentioned a case overseas in Europe where they are talking about paying 
some of the some of the rent mm. on a property if people are working from home. Yeah, there's a case just recently in Switzerland where the case was heard in the High Court over there, or equivalent of, and it deemed that the employer was responsible for paying a share of the rent. Um, on the argument was that the employee's paying the rent for the house, and now you've brought your workplace there, yeah. therefore you, you need to pay some rent on that. Um, wow. um, and again, how far do you go on that? Uh, does the employee rent another room or another another unit for you? Uh, so, you know, there's all these other questions. So every time you answer one question, another three or four appear. And so we're just trying to, with all the parties, come together with some form of a bit of a matrix or or a decision tree as to how employers might, might approach this, given that the ultimate test will be heard by a court. You know. True. And I guess th- that's it's policy on the fly as well. And mm-hmm. are we expecting that um, your recommendations will be, be handed to government to, to give guidance around this for the government agencies? Yeah, well, WorkSafe and uh, business.gov.nz, they also p- are offering current advice, but it's all very general and that's fine. Yeah. Um, but a case is heard on specifics. So we're just trying to take that a little bit further. Uh, with a whole lot of people thinking about it and saying, well, what is reasonable? How far do you go? Because what we have found post-COVID is for the first year of COVID, there was a huge amount of wraparound services. Every day your boss was calling you, are you okay? There were fun nights on Tuesday nights and then there was (laughs) virtual drinks on Friday and all that kind of really good stuff. Second year, that all kind of fell away. And now what we're hearing is people are working on their own. And some of them are feeling quite um, isolated. Okay. Some of them are gif- feeling quite depressed. So that's a mental health well-being angle mm. that fits into this as well. So it's not so much the ergonomic, which is important, but the mental health state. Okay. And so uh, we're just trying to think about, well, how far do you go as an employer to um, address that obligation? Because under the Act, under the Health and Safety at Work Act, the employer's got no right of entry in, into your workplace. Yes. So if you say, no, you can't come in, then all they can do is give you information. Wow. Is, is, that, is that valid? So, yeah. it, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm trying to um, rationalise in my own mind. But if we, just, if we just accept that in a workplace, mm-hmm. while you're on, on site, there's a bunch of laws that, that protect you as an employee and, and the employer mm-hmm. has to abide by them. And when you're working at home, um, it's it's very much the same, Correct. but what we've got is confusion around when does work start, when does it finish, yep. which rooms and which locations, yep. um, and and things like if you can't enter a premises to set up a, a, yep. a desk, how do you do that and cover yourself? It's yeah, and how does an employer undertake a risk assessment of your workplace? And what if you leave your workplace to shoot down the road to to do an errand? Is that still going to be work? Yep. And if you hurt yourself in that trip, does it seem to be work-related? Um, if you change locations, if you're living in a house here and you want to go to the beach and work, is the second place a place of work. So there are just so many angles to all this. You're right. And, I mean, you, you've mentioned well-being, which is obviously a hot topic around mm-hmm. this. And um, I know of people that suddenly find themselves by themselves yep. you know, almost, you know, for three or four days in a row if they haven't got any sort of virtual meetings. Yep. And um, they're saying that productivity is impacted. Mm-hmm. And all of this remote working was supposed to be about a bit more freedom, yep. same amount of productivity. So we're really getting to the pointy end of a philosophical debate here, aren't we? And is it just easier, PJ, to bring people back in the office? That's always going to be the fallback position. Um, what we also know is people who do work from home, and especially females, but it can be males as well, also uh, looking after children. So they may be looking after children, toddlers, they may be preparing meals, and then they'll choose to work later on at night. So then the question becomes, well, is one o'clock in the morning, from an employee's perspective, is that what I want you to, to be doing? Yeah. If you're still sending emails at one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, well, that's not what we had in mind. Yes. So I think what employers had in mind was you'd kind of clock in virtually at eight o'clock and you'd work through till four, yeah. and then you'd carry on your life. But what we've seen from that is is a hybrid day. So you do a bit of this, you do a bit of washing, you do a bit of child mind, da 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 da. So your day gets extended. Right. Um, and that's not good for mental health. 
and well-being and, and fatigue and all those things. And, and it's not good for the employer's duty of care because it's extending the time frame that you're actually responsible for mm. someone. So, and, and it's all coming yeah. back to that duty of care principle. Mm. Mm. Well, it is. And, and until it's really tested, um, we won't know where the court's going to put some boundaries down. I'm not familiar with any th- activities that uh, WorkSafe are doing at the moment. So this is, could be pending, but we don't know. But, but as I said before, what we're trying to do is just to second guess what would be, what would a good employer, and I hate that term, but what would a good employer do and how far is reasonable? Okay, so I mean, on that, you, you know, you've been in this industry for a long time and you, you, you have um, right in there when we're talking about policy development and strategy. Yeah. So w- what are your predictions? What, what are your maybe top three things an employer could do that they'll probably end up having to do, but what yeah. could they do right now to try and minimise their, their risk around this? I think if we go back to basics, certainly from a work safe perspective, because they're the only ones who can really prosecute in this area, is the issue of... of training so have you trained your staff how to set up a workstation have you provided them with information so that's that's a fairly easy thing to do um, maintaining constant communication with your staff so weekly call-ins by supervisors whatever else okay. um, and I think the other thing we haven't really talked about is the whole um, security issue because you might be um, managing files that other people in your household can see so personal information, that's a really big one. Right. And, of course, cyber security. So yeah. is your setup at, at, at home secure as, as it might be at work? Yeah. Um, so there are other layers to all this. Um, so training, supervision, training and information are, are the important ones. If, you, if it's going to be long term, then I think it would be a good idea to try and get your employees' consent. I stress the word consent to offer them assistance in setting up a workplace at their workplace. Yes. Um, but I think underlying all that is monitoring work and workload and hours of work. Fair enough. So, I mean, basically, it's, it's out of sight is not out of mind. No. And we have to, you know, all remind ourselves of that, and myself included. But um, one of the things that's raised for me is that we, we have – really a virtual office and we have an in-house office that yep. people can come back to particularly if they're doing you know two mm. two days at home three days of the week and one of the benefits from a from a company's perspective is reduction in lease costs if people are working from home but I'm not seeing that happening so you know what are the what are the what's the leverage apart from flexibility probably competitiveness for recruitment what what are the advantages for an employer to to keep hybrid work and remote working going well, what we're seeing from the research, employees say they want flexibility and they want to work from home. So that's a win from them. What I, what I don't think people at work have thought through is the long term of that. Okay. So then we're getting the negative side of that. Some people can work virtually at home quite happily. They're very self-motivated, very disciplined, and they can do it. But if you're a social person... Yeah then I think you might struggle. Okay. Um, so I think I just get the feel that this is a wee bit like a pendulum. It's gone from eight to five at work through COVID to totally working from home. I think we might just be on the top of that. And then we might be coming back a little bit. I know overseas uh, research shows, again, that people who are working hybridly, there seems to be an increase in productivity. Um I guess the caution of me would say at what medium to long term cost okay. to the person. Yeah. Yeah, uh, look, it's a good point. And I've noticed that there's a couple of things that have to happen for um, remote working to be effective, which you've sort of hit on it is productivity. You have to move from a nine to five, you've, you've been mm-hmm. here in the office, so you've done your work, to output focus. Here's a project, yeah. you know, these are the deadlines, and that's how I can track yeah. pretty much what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so there is a, it's a high trust model. And personality types yeah. operate differently in that environment. But from an ACC perspective, none of that's going to matter if there's no. a prosecution in front of them. Um, they're not going to take into account any of those factors. No. I mean, any prosecution that we're safe takes will be on, on, the, on, the, on the information at hand. So if you've shown that you've given information, you've showed that you've trained, you've got videos, you've got online things people can go to and see, da, 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 then you've done your bit. The question's always going to be, was it enough? Okay. And what we often find is 
post event, post prosecution, uh, the employer brings out something else. Okay. Almost the following week. So in the court's mind, they would say, well, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? That was reasonable. It was feasible. It was practicable. So why didn't you do it earlier? Okay. So that's hindsight. Yeah. Um, but it still comes down to what do you do to manage the risk? So by doing good risk assessment and mitigating all the points that you can is the only thing you can do. Okay, thank you. So my takeaways from this are those, those three things you've mentioned and also rec- recording that you're doing these things mm. is, is vital. Mm. But um, one of the things we probably need to talk more about for, from manager-leader perspective is that is that connection and the fact yep. that that has dropped off, and yep. you know that the team meetings um, are probably not happening because you yep. might be in a in a group meeting, but we still need to keep all of those yep. basic um, yep. fundamentals of good management going yep. in a virtual way. Yep. I mean, if we exclude the population of people that are self motivated and they like what they're doing, so let's park those, and that could be say twenty five percent. The other seventy percent will do it because it's nice, it's novel, but the novelty wears off. Okay. And we know, from again, from overseas research that the, the, the level of engagement of staff is lower than the managers think it is. Um, around about a third of your staff are always thinking about leaving. Right. The other third are on the fence, and only a third of them really like you. So, <laughs> so you've got to kind of manage that. Um, and, and really finding novel ways to keep them engaged, um, I think, is going to be a challenge going forward. Um, it could well be in the future that when people finally do get together and they're all strangers they don't know who's, who's <laughs> on the team because they've never seen them before uh, so that's the other side of the coin so I think I think finding that happy medium and I know for certainly for larger companies I'd, I'm going to be recommending I think that they have a, a hybrid working coordinator Okay. so I'm, I'm talking for larger businesses here with a lot of people out there and their sole role is to find ways to engage staff. Look, I think that's a really brilliant idea. And, I mean, the the thought of a, a new role in this um, world where everyone's terrified automation's going to take jobs mm. is, a, is also a great thing. But one thing I've noticed is that you might decide to come in on a, on a day where most of the office is working from home. And you're literally alone in the office. Mm. So mm. It's, not, it's not necessarily an individual um, solution. It's, mm. it's a company-wide solution. Yeah, and, and again, I think, you know, I, I talk about this as, as being novel because it really is quite a novel at the moment. And, you know, we haven't, if you think of COVID really, it's only two or three years, so it's, it's very early in the change management kind of stuff. Mm. We've always done it for the rehab side of things, and, and but that's short term. Yeah. And there's always a goal to come back to work and there's always a desk for you. And, and even even if you're doing rehab, you know, people come back for, for staff meetings and celebrations or whatever else. But we don't see that with hybrid working. You're yeah. out there, you're on your own. Um, and I think I think we might find more problems mid-term, long-term than we're seeing now. Okay. That's just my prediction. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's what we're talking about, you know, is is because no one knows, particularly in New Zealand context, what we're doing is is best guess and yeah. trying to prepare. Yeah. Um, so you've given me some, some ideas of what a company can do almost like as a – bare minimum, yeah. what, what's going to be the Rolls-Royce of duty of care for a remote worker? Yeah, well, again, this goes on the company size. Okay, So we talk about compliance, we talk about compliance plus, and then we talk about best practice. Yes. All right, that's my kind of modelling. So best practice, you'd have a coordinator, you'd have a, a whole lot of events programmed through the year. Um, participation would be mandatory. Yeah. There'd be, say, quarterly... Um, face-to-face staff meetings, functions, just to keep that face-to-face, that social dialogue going on rather than through Zoom or Teams or whatever else. Okay. Um, I think I think there'd be a lot more ongoing monitoring. Um, so supervisors and that kind of layer upwards would be part of their KPIs would, would be to have at least fortnightly calls with individuals. How okay. are you getting on? Um, what's going on in your life because work is I mean you spend a third of your life at work so it may as well be enjoyable yeah the other third you're sleeping <laughs> and the other third you're supposed to be out there enjoying yourself so, fair yeah. enough and look it's, it's, you've raised a really good point is that 
what we're asking managers and leaders to do is is the basics of management and leadership, which Manage is people. looking after people. Mm. But the reality is, you, you know, you're a manager, you know, PJ, when you, you've got people, but they're normally an adjunct on top mm. of the work you've got to get done every mm. day. Yeah. So I guess another fundamental change is going to have to be to free up the space for the managers and leaders to do that. Otherwise, yeah. they're going to be the ones at risk in, in the well-being capacity. Yeah, I don't think we can rely on HR managers to do this. I think as they come down, if you're if you're managing people, it'd be your role to budget some virtual some time to actually do those those calls because that's what people need. Right. Well, like as always, PJ's starting a project, um, you know, with some key partners you've worked with extensively, and it's probably raising more questions than it answers. Mm. But it's touching it's touching across the whole debate of the future of work, mm. and you know, you're a man who's, who's been around for a while, PJ. What do you think the office is going to look like in 10 years' time? I think because hybrid has worked so well, I think this is just teething problems. Once we get it sorted out, um, I think that that'll continue. It's always going to be there for rehab, for the short-term stuff. It's always going to be there for the, the floods and the, and the pandemics. But the company's strategic plan to work hybridly, that's still going to mature. Um, I think I'm going to say that there'll be some people that will get sick of it and they'd like to come back to work. And so that might be a bit of a challenge five, seven, ten years' time, yes. finding space. Yep. Um, but I think, I think the future of work, irrespective of COVID, is going to be different. Mm. Um, I think people are going to be doing, rather than doing one job all day, you may end up by doing two or three jobs part of a day or part of a week uh, because... Of, Artificial intelligence will take over some of our mundane parts of the job, so your job will expand somewhere else. Which brings me on to another point that employees need to maintain their employability right. because the world's changing. And we talk about the future work, well, the future's now, if it's today. It was yesterday. <laughs> and, and it's not coming, it's here. Yep. And, and we're just part of it. Slow motion, uh, and, and employees, especially the younger generation, they're going to have to think a lot smarter about maintaining their employability. But that might be something else we talk about. Look, it's a good point, though, because when you look at um, the, the ageing workforce mm -hmm. and the fact that 2025, I think around 75% of the workforce will be millennial, mm -hmm. then you're, you're looking at a new generation of expectations. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, as, as much as we need to figure out the policy, they probably won't accept a move back to mm. to in the office. So uh, this is, it's very, very interesting, PJ. And like, I'd love to keep in touch with you about yep. what the results are. So what's your what's your process from here um, on this project? Yeah, well, we've got some more meetings planned with our stakeholders in this group. Um, at the moment, we're getting a whole literature search of what's who's got what and analysing all that. Um, uh, then we'll get some overseas research and have a, see that, and then we'll start building a bit of a model. I've been playing around with my ideas that'll be put into the pot. Great. Um, and then we'll just try and tease it out, and I guess what we're trying to do at the end would be some form of a best practice guideline given those three models of compliance, compliance plus, and best practice. Brilliant. And look, I mean, I think this is what the EMA does best is we, we're we aware of an issue's there. It's not being addressed. So we jump in and try and mm. help with, with the, you know, the experts yes. and partners. So our members will mm. be will be prepared. Um, Correct, yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's great work. And anything else you want to add, PJ? Um, no, I'll just go back to my virtual world. Yeah, you're working <laughs> from home tomorrow, are you? <laughs> Look, everyone, thank you so much for joining us on the EMA cast. And uh, if you've got any topics um, that you'd like us to cover, let us know. If you've got questions for PJ or myself, please let us know as well. And uh, thank you for your time.